Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I am, as Jill said, Carmen Thompson. I oversee hedge funds, distressed, and opportunistic investments for Rice's endowment, Rice University's endowment. And opportunistic is the funnest part of my job uh, because it is the sleeve of capital that has managers that do not neatly fit in any other traditional category. And they are unique. The investment strategies there are unique. And in that role, we get to see lots and lots of managers who think they are unique and uniquely good. Some of them are uniquely good. Some of them are uniquely bad. But every once in a while, the universe gives you a manager, an investment strategy, and an investment manager that are uniquely great. And one of those managers is here today, and it's Jerry O'Brien. He is the CEO and CIO of O'Brien Staley Partners. That is, uh, their firm is an investing firm that specializes in credit investments, but it's a niche. It's a niche uh, strategy that focuses on what they describe as, and I love this phrase, unloved loans, unloved commercial and industrial loans. Um, Ten years ago, Jerry had 25 years' experience in this industry, and he co-founded OSP with Warren Staley, who is the retired chairman of Cargill in Minneapolis, which is why Jerry's firm is in Minneapolis. Jerry worked for Cargill and Carval for 17 years and was a founding partner of, of Carval and oversaw global loan portfolios for them. Early in his career, he trained as a credit analyst, and um, I will tell you from overseeing investment managers for 15 years, credit analysis early in a career makes some of the best investors in the world because they just ask better questions, even if they eventually end up in equity or equity type things. Credit analyst, credit analysis will serve you so well in an investing career. Jerry did that for various banks early in his career. Chemical Bank, which is part of J.P. Morgan Chase now, DG Bank, uh, Comerica Bank. Um, and he, he's an undergrad from University of Michigan in economics, and he got an MBA in analytical finance and marketing from the University of Chicago. And when we first met Jerry, OSP was a brand new firm, and it is very rare for Rice, Rice's endowment to invest in a first-time fund and a first-time firm. But Jerry and his team had been doing this uh, for years before. They were already seasoned professionals with a track record to prove that they could drive results. Students, this is a firm that has grown to uh, manage over a billion dollars, a billion three, a little bit over that, and they are growing both staff, uh, assets, uh, and I could think of no better place to work, honestly, than uh, for someone like Jerry O'Brien. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming him to the stage. He's going to answer a question. This is truly the question that are, is on investors' mind. What time is it in the financial markets and the credit markets? So Jerry, come tell us the time. Thanks, Tommy. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Just a quick test. OK, thank you. It's uh, great to be back within the hedges, as they say here at Rice. and. Uh, uh, if you've never heard of O'Brien Staley Partners before, that just proves that our marketing strategy is working. Because <laughs> if, uh, if we always say, if you know how to make money, why would you ever tell anybody? Right? Why would you keep that to yourself? And the answer to why am I here now is very simple, because the ask came from the investment office, from, from Carmen and from Allison and, and, and Kirsten. And, and you know, I will be forever grateful, you know, as, as Carmen already uh, explained, uh, Rice was an investor in our very first fund. And I remember our first meeting, 2013, we were upstairs at Lovett Hall. Uh, Mark Moore is director of investment, uh, uh, investor relations, and I were there. And uh, Carmen read every scrap of paper that we sent in advance. Uh, and, and Allison kicked back and watched uh, Carmen ask, you know, very provocative, probing, but right on the button questions. And I think we got along well, 
uh, because we answer the questions. And I tried to answer the question concretely with a backup of data and to share the twist, the plot twist. There's always something that you weren't expecting and that's where you find your buried alpha in a transaction. So as a, uh, a favor, and I recognize, as you were saying, uh, and, and if, you, if you don't know this, for anybody to invest in a first time fund, it takes courage and conviction and there's a little bit of career risk when you make that decision. And so as out of gratitude, uh, anytime that Carmen or anybody at Rice asks for a professional favor, the answer is always yes, provided it fits in the calendar. And uh, it, it's easy to get to uh, Houston in February when you're coming from Minnesota. That fits the calendar. <laughs> that fits the calendar pretty easily. So, uh, and, and so you know what we're going to do today is is we're going to talk uh, uh, candidly with you, you know, and try to be intimate, even though it's a, a large group, uh, as if we were all upstairs at Lovett Hall with our respective teams you know, going through our, our investment thesis and strategies. And speaking of, of, of our respective teams, uh, joined today uh, is Terry DeWitt uh, up there in the back row, who's Managing Director of Investments uh, in our Waco office. Uh, so if you're interested in jobs uh, in, and staying in Texas, we have an office in Waco. Uh, and then uh, also from our team, Mark Moores, we would get a little wave, Mark Moores, who's uh, Head of Investor Relations, uh, and then Kate, uh, Hurley. Kate is a director of marketing, so the pizza and beer tonight are on her expense account, so thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, and then the most important person in the room, if you're a student looking for a job, is our director of talent recruiting, Jill Will Robbie. Jill, will you give a little, a little wave? So we'll all be at the, at the uh, happy hour uh, with the pizza and the beer afterwards, so you can you know, connect with, with everybody here. So uh, uh, as, as Carmen said, uh, the title of the, of the remarks uh, is, what time is it? But when you're from Minnesota, the home of Prince and Purple Rain. You don't just say what time, yep, somebody's ahead of me. So you don't just say what time is it, you say it with a little bit of swagger, like Morris Day. You say, what time is it? Okay. And, and if you are my compliance guy, he would say, you know what, it's time to show an SEC boilerplate statement. <laughs> that poor Kate, director of marketing, said, Jerry, you can't. Do that, or you're going to lose your audience. Me, I said, relax. We we'll get a little more Morris Day. So, so, so you got the point. This is for discussion purposes only. You are not invited to invest. And 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 more seriously now, uh, you know, when when the, the question what what time is it is the core question that investors you know are are asking these days, and it comes out in an infinite mer you know number of ways. They'll say, you know, Jerry. What do you think about this, you know, 10-year bull market? Jerry, what do you think about the, the when's the cycle, the credit cycle going to repeat? Jerry, what about, you know, the, the chronic budget deficits? What about trade tariffs? You know, what, what about the inverted yield curve? And, you know, I guess it inverted again today. Uh, and, and uh, you know, all of these questions really distill down to a core big, big picture question of, you know, where is O'Brien's Daily Partners finding compelling, distressed investment opportunities at this late stage of the credit cycle. And when I get that question from, from our institutional investors, I always answer, I have to remind them, and, and, and Carmen actually said it, but we actually don't invest in distress. We invest in unloved loans. And, and we had to coin that phrase, unloved, because nobody understood what the hell we were talking about. And uh, I remember, uh, one of the very first, earliest uh, investor meetings uh, I had when we were raising our first fund was with a family office in Connecticut. And uh, uh, I had met with an analyst on the team and talked about my 17 years of investing $3 billion for Cargill and Carval. And then he, you know, another meeting, he introduced me to his boss, a managing director, and he really liked, you know, the uniqueness of what we were doing. And on the third meeting, they invited us back to meet the patriarch. Uh, and you know, we sat down with the patriarch and the whole team that we've had two other meetings with, and, and we were explaining that you know, we invest in credit intensive opportunities, management intensive situation, orphaned assets, dislocated uh, markets or capital vacuums, and I'm 45 minutes into the presentation, and the patriarch holds up his hand, he says, what do you do? <laughs> I'm like, oh crap, 45 minutes into this presentation and the guy doesn't have a clue what I do. And I realized that I, you know, I realized nobody invests in anything they don't understand and I spent 45 minutes, game over. So there were another five or 10 minutes of pleasantries, shook hands, left, and as I was riding the train from Connecticut to New York to catch a plane, 
back back to uh, Minneapolis, uh, I, I was staring out the window of the train, and I was crestfallen. I mean, you know, what, would, what did I do wrong? I mean, I, I'm a pretty good communicator, but this guy wasn't following me. And as I'm staring out the, 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 the window of the train, uh, I see a billboard. It's one of those garish yellow and orange ones. You've all seen it. You all know it. We buy ugly houses, right? And it makes you cringe a little bit when you see that, right? You cringe just a little bit. But you're not unclear. You know exactly what that guy does, right? And so I said, you know, OSP needs its own bumper sticker. So, you know, we don't buy ugly houses. In fact, we don't even invest in mortgages. We do commercial credits. But, you know, we came up with our own, and this is when we coined unloved, unloved U.S. CNI loans in five to $25 million transactions. That's our bumper sticker. It's a Texas-sized bumper sticker, but it's a, it's a bumper sticker. And so let me, uh, let me unpack that for you a little bit. Unloved is meant to really differentiate we're not buying non-performing loans. We're not buying flat on its back distress. Okay, so 80 or better, more than 80, about 88% of what we buy is actually cash flow positive, cash flowing right now. Uh, and so we, we define it as a performing loan, but not according to the standards that I was trained in my classic credit training. Rather, we call it jokingly the O'Brien standard of performing. You know, it paid last month, and I still expect it to pay this month. That's a performing loan. Okay? It could be you know, paying under a forbearance or a modification, paying you know, uh, you know, an approved bankruptcy plan, or spontaneously paying past maturity. But there's a world of difference between a loan that's paying and one that's not paying. And so we focus our attention on those loans. Uh, U.S. means we concentrate on the U.S. We are leaving all of the extra credit risk of the emerging markets or international taxation uh, off, off the table uh, and, and just focusing our efforts in, in the U.S. C&I loans is a banking uh, 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 definition, and it means commercial and industrial loans. And that is a business loan that may or may not have real estate collateral. If it does have real estate collateral, you, the best thing to think of, classic example, would be a bowling alley. Okay? So you make a loan to a bowling alley, you're secured by the real estate of the bowling alley and hopefully the liquor license. The real estate is really dedicated use, because if it's not going to be a bowling alley, what are you, you, know, you going to do? You're going to store telephone poles in there? You know, it's it's no, no other use. So uh, that would be a classic example of a loan where you're secured by the business and, and the, the critical asset there would actually be the liquor license. Okay. And then the scale of uh, 5 to $25 million. This is a key differentiator versus other people who like our strategies, like our kind of trades, but raise $5 billion funds. If you raise a $5 billion fund, you can't cross the street for less than a $100 million opportunity. When you get late stage in the credit cycle, eh, you go down to $50 million, Okay, But you never join me down at 25. million. So we, we are relatively un... un uh, bothered by, by big ticket uh, competitors down in this space. So these tra transactions uh, we source from three channels across the business cycle. The regulatory channel, the municipal channel, and garage sales. And, and the regulatory channel really means banks that are cleaning up their balance sheet either directly as a result of a regulator or in anticipation of a regulator. The municipal channel and I want to get ahead of this. I don't mean municipal bonds. I don't mean municipal credit. I actually mean municipal assets, the left side of their balance sheet. So really economic development loans. Uh, and then the third one is garage sales. This is a phrase Mark Morris and I uh, in invented uh, to really make the point of discontinued businesses. When, when a business strategy has changed or dis is, is discontinued, uh, you can actually find transactions uh, in that marketplace. And uh, the, big, the big question is, where are you finding your deals right now? And, and when people say that, it's kind of an acknowledgement that uh, the banks have never been healthier, right? The, in, in the whole country, the delinquency rate is about 1%. And bank M&A is blowing and going. The banks are merging at 1.8, 2, 2.2 2 times book. And so when, you know, when investors and LPs say, you know, Jerry, there's no distress in the whole country, they're right. And in fact, last year, there were 258 bank mergers last year. Here's a list of all 258 bank pairings. Uh, it's meant for impression, not for reading. But, uh, uh, and, and so what we actually do is we contact all of those banks to see if they have any discontinued businesses. And here's, here's a little plot twist. You know, bank mergers come out of the CEO and the CFO's office. 
and the CEO and the CFO, they'll identify a, a target bank, they'll evaluate its footprint, its loan growth, its deposit growth, and whether that acquisition will be accretive or dilutive to, to their share price. After they cut that deal, then they send in the chief credit officer to evaluate, uh, you know, is there anything in this we wish wasn't there? And I gotta tell you, there's usually something inside of every merger they wish was not part of it. They tolerate it for the sake of the trade, but if they could get rid of it, it would be better. And if you're a CFO, you're solving a different set of equations than a chief credit officer. A chief financial officer is worrying about his institution's multiples. PE multiple, multiple of book, EBITDA multiple, something like that. Chief credit officer is worrying about his asset recovery, right? So you know, that he, he, he knows, I know those assets, I know that market, I got a team, I got a cheap balance sheet, I can work, work it out. But the chief financial officer is like, well there's something in, in you're, you're clouding my narrative and you're draining my, my multiple. So there's something in that transaction he doesn't want to explain at the next board of directors meeting, the regulatory review, fiscal year end, because it's not a question of one or two cents on the dollar. You're taking my multiple down by 0.2 or 0.5. And so let's get rid of that and make sure it goes away. So we, we reach out to, to all of them. Uh, and let me, let me give you a couple examples. Two banks merged in Wisconsin. Uh, the Bank of Wapaka was bought by First uh, uh, Wisconsin Bank. Uh, bank of Wapaka, about a $200 million bank, had made some perfectly good performing loans to budget motels uh, in Texas. And the, the loans are paying as agreed, no problem. Well, the merger occurs and they do the operating due diligence and these loans for a bank in Texas, are, I'm sorry, for a bank in Wisconsin, are considered out of territory. And out of territory is a criticized type of loan because the regulators, their philosophy is, how many banks did that borrower in the panhandle of Texas have to drive by to find you in the woods of Wisconsin? You're clearly the lender of last resort. So that's on the origination, right? Then on the servicing, what's the chances the chief credit officer is ever gonna drive by that hotel on his way to or from work? He's gonna be the very last guy to ever know if there's a motorcycle gang hanging out in the parking lot, right? So you're the worst originator and you're the worst owner and servicer. Criticized assets get bad reserve requirements and it defines the nature of every regulatory review thereafter. So in this merger, they want it to go away and they want it to go away you know, in quick, very quickly after the, the merger. Uh, and so we were able to buy those loans, actually Terry DeWitt, Waco office, uh, underwrote those loans, bought them, serviced them, paid as agreed, some of them actually paid off. So we buy them at a, at a discount, uh, get the current yield that is then enhanced by buying at a discount. When it pays off in full, you get a nice pop because a discount instrument gives a nicer return. Uh, a little bit larger transaction, uh, uh, Santander, the multinational bank out of Spain uh, bought a super regional named Sovereign's Bank uh, and for over 10 years Sovereign Bank had made loans to doctors, dentists, lawyers secured by their personal aircraft. Okay? And you know Santander, this merger wasn't about that, this merger was you know an expansion, a strategic expansion in the United States. They did not want to have a personal aircraft business line in, in, their, in, in their merged entities. Uh, we were delighted to get the opportunity to, to, to bid on and we won this portfolio uh, because from our perspective, that portfolio was already 10 years seasoned, it's 100% performing, 10 years seasoned, amortized down 40%. And in our experience, people don't pay 10 years before walking away from their debt. They don't pay back 40% of the debt before walking away from it. We bought this also at a discount, nice cash on cash yield and a great prepayment speed uh, to enhance our yields on that too. Third example, uh, two credit unions in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area. Uh, big, big credit union doing a merger and in the process of this merger, the strategic intent was to get what's called the golden ticket, which in, in credit union land is the, the uh, uh, license or, or, or the authorization to have relationships and lending across the country. You're not just limited to your geography or your original owner base. But coming along with that golden ticket, the Target Bank had a $60 million portfolio of loans to New York City taxi drivers. And, and obviously the CEO loved the, you know, the golden ticket, that is his strategy. He did not want to carry the narrative 
of New York City taxi medallion loans to his otherwise beautiful merger. Uh, and so we were invited actually to, to bid on this. When I, first, and, and, and when I first started working on this portfolio with the team, we went to discuss it with Warren Staley, the chairman of the firm. I, I, uh, I joked with him, I said, Warren, Uber's just a fad. And, and yeah, that's what he said too. And he's, he knows me by now, so he knew there was a, you know, there was a punchline coming. I said, okay, stick with me. But you know, from our perspective, this is our thesis. If after five years of being in daily competition with Uber and Lyft, you're still driving your taxi and you're still paying your loan, we think you're a pretty good cabbie and a credit conscientious borrower. We can price adjust and find a great current cash yield to make that work for us. So we did that too. Uh, so when the cycle, when the cycle eventually repeats itself or turns, we'll start to see more transactions from the regulatory channel. And there's already a few canaries in the coal mine, if you will. There were four bank failures last year, uh, and just before that, there was a large one in New Orleans called First NBC. Uh, and the First NBC is kind of a, a, a fun story. Uh, there's a, a guy on our team named Bruce Weintraub. Bruce is the director of deal flow marketing. It's Bruce's job to call all of those 258 banks that merged uh, and see if there are any uh, you know, unloved or discontinued business opportunities. He also tracks all of the bank regulatory filings and he keeps tabs on their ratios. And anytime somebody's uh, non-performing asset ratio goes up or their tier one ratio goes down, he asks this question and calls them up and says, hey, I noticed your ratio's changed. You know, Anything, uh, you know, any discontinued businesses that you might want us to give you a bid for? And so about three years ago, first NBC's ratios took a turn. Bruce called him up and he was met with a very gruff answer. What are you talking about? I saw that your ratios changed. I don't know what you're talking about. Basically, the guy said, don't call us, we'll call you. Okay, no problem. Move on to the next one. About five months later, Bruce reads in the, you know, the uh, industry press that this bank had sold branches to a rival. Well, you don't sell branches to a rival unless you've got a problem, right? So he called him back up, and uh, this time, the voice was a little different. You know, you have any, any discontinued business? Well, yeah, actually we do. Uh, but you guys probably don't know anything about new markets tax credit, you know, structured transactions, do you? Well, indeed we do. We've done about a dozen of them. So uh, Terry and I and a couple other members of the team went down to New Orleans, met with the management team, looked at this business unit that was making loans designed to create jobs, stimulate you know, uh, regeneration to low and moderate income neighborhoods. It has a credit, you meaning a, a lending credit piece, it has a tax credit piece, and then it has a little bit of an operating company piece. So it's pretty complex. And uh, we had a great conversation with the bank. We took the information back to our office with the you know, intention of delivering them what we call an indicative bid non-binding on us, non-binding on them. Let's just see if our price zones overlap. This team works on it for about two weeks and then uh, comes, comes and shows me the work. I'm like, oh boy, we're gonna face a shoot the messenger risk on this. This is so bad that they're just gonna think, you know, that we're gaming them or something. So we work really, really hard to craft a letter that explains the whole thing and we show that, you know, this portion of your portfolio was worth something in the 90 cent range this portion's in the low 80s. Unfortunately, this piece over here is worth less than 50 cents on the dollar. So we, we write it all up. Look at the letter, I was like, yeah, that's not gonna fix it. This guy's still gonna be pissed off. So I, I, you know, I said, maybe I should just call him myself. You know, this is the kind of thing you gotta deliver person to person, not a letter comes in the mail or via email. So I call the guy up and I say, hey, and Brad, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you wanna talk about this before we send you the letter. You know, it's, you know, a little bit sensitive, and sometimes you like to have a conversation. What are you talking about? I'm just saying that maybe you want to see, you know, we'd like to verbalize this way. Nah, just, just send me the damn letter. Okay. Send, right? Calls back up. What the hell is wrong with you guys? <laughs> so he was clearly irritated. Uh, we surprised him. He said, these are performing loans. Like, yeah, but 2% for 30 years, man. I mean, you know, a U.S. savings bond trades at 50 cents on the dollar. What do you, what do you want me to do for you? And uh, anyway, it didn't go anywhere. The trade didn't happen. About five weeks later, plot twist. On a Friday afternoon, a caravan of black Suburbans pulls into the bank, and the FDIC shut down the bank. 
and they gave all the assets. They actually hired three different loan sale advisors. And so the portfolio that we had already looked at and underwritten were scattered to this loan sale advisor, that loan sale advisor, and a third loan sale advisor. And the whole, the whole deal team in our, in our shop, we were crestfallen. You know, the opportunity is just, you know, went everywhere. But I said to the team, I said, well, buried inside a chaos is where you find alpha, right? And there's nobody else on the planet who saw this jigsaw puzzle before they threw it all over the planet. Uh, and so we persevered. We went through three different loan sales and substantially re, re, reconstructed the portfolio and we won it and it's, it's paid very nicely for us ever since. So that's how we find the deals in the regulatory channel. The third channel is what I said was municipal. And, and I made the point we're not talking about municipal debt, we're talking about economic development loans. And you know, it's completely independent cycle from the regular business cycle. This pretty much tracks, better tracks, election cycles. You know, but nothing transacts six months before an election or six months after, and it's whenever they run out of money. Because you know, when you get a budget deficit, you got four choices, right? You can raise taxes, and no politicians like to do that. Yeah, you can raise more debt, and depending upon your, your status, you, know, you might not be able to. You can cut services, and they don't like to do that. Or you can divest unnecessary businesses. And there are other funds uh, that are pursuing similar strategies in infrastructure, or maybe toll roads, or parking meters, or garages, or hospitals. We are the very best at buying in the secondary market economic development loans. And I say we're the very best because our team has sourced, originated, resolved economic development loans from South Carolina, Virginia, New Jersey, New York, City of New York, District of Columbia, City of Baltimore, City of Cincinnati, State of Washington, and most recently, Puerto Rico. And uh, uh, so this, this is, we love Puerto Rico. Our very first investment in Puerto Rico actually was in 1999. And to be clear, we're not talking about investing in the sovereign credit of Puerto Rico, but rather in commercial businesses in Puerto Rico. And, and there's a conventional wisdom that you know, no credit inside of a sovereign is less risky than the sovereign. And we actually disagree with that thesis that's so you know, conventionally held. We think there's a lot of businesses in Puerto Rico that are less risky than the Puerto Rican government. Uh, and, and so we, we, uh, let, me, let me give you, uh, you know, kind of a fun example. Chris, you might enjoy this one. Who knew that there were cows in Puerto Rico? And in fact, a whole dairy, dairy market. Um, you know, long before the hurricane, before the earthquakes, before the financial crisis in Puerto Rico, they had a stated public policy of supporting the local dairy industry. Because if you think about it, if you want to have fresh milk in Puerto Rico, you can't fill a tanker full and float it out to the middle of the Atlantic. You actually have to have the cows there. And so the government of Puerto Rico did two things. They established a milk quota system that makes sure that, you know, that, that actually licenses uh, dairy farmers. They have you know, a certain number of quarts of milk per month they can sell to the pasteurizer or, or, or uh, you know, processor. Uh, and then they also made economic development loans at a low rate and a long date, typically less than 4% interest rate long term. The, the, the market is developed and it, doesn't, you know, it stays in equilibrium due to this, this control, uh, but then the financial crisis hit and the general obligations of Puerto Rico were trading north of 13%. So you know, just think about that. They're borrowing at 13% and lending at less than 4%. They are permanently inverted. They're losing money every month and having trouble making payroll. So we were able to actually uh, underwrite the loan portfolio and buy the, 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 the dairy loans from the Economic Development Authority of Puerto Rico at a yield that was less than, than 13 and a little bit more than four, more than four. And, and uh, as a result, they no longer had a negative burn and they had cash to make their current payroll. The, the dairy farmers continue to enjoy their original terms. We didn't change anything, you know, so that long, long date and low rate, they continue to have the benefit of, and they paid as agreed just to us instead of the Government Economic Development Authority. Pay as agreed for about two years and then plot twist, literally twist, right? The hurricane came through. And I know right now you're all thinking like Helen Hunt in the movie Twister and the cow flying by. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty, oh, I don't know what happened there. It's a pretty serious topic. But um, the good news is 
all the borrowers and all of their herds are safe and we're intact. But you don't take your dairy cows in the bunker with you when the hurricane comes, right? The, the, the herd is left to hunker down uh, in the valley or the glen uh, and ride out the storm. And as a result, I mean, no, no joke, they were stressed, you know, and their milk production dropped by, you know, 30% uh, immediately after, after the hurricane. And it was that way for several months. So, you know, the, the dairy farmers genuinely had a credit crisis. And, you know, we worked with them on a case-by-case -case basis to lower their payments. And in, in general, we, gave a, you know, we allowed them to pay 50% for six months uh, until they got their herd stabilized and, and up and running. And, and you know, that's, that's just the way we worked with them on that. Um, you know, I, I guess I've, I've talked about bowling alleys and I've talked about taxis and I've talked about uh, dairies. Uh, and I've talked about airplanes, and you might be wondering, how the heck do you guys underwrite all those different types of things? And, you know, the answer is the same. You know, it's the classic credit training system that I was taught at Chemical Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. It goes by the acronym CAMEL, right? So every single credit you look at, you analyze the capital stack, the assets that are your collateral, the management team or the ownership and, and their, their track record of success whether the business is cash flow positive and earning or not, and whether they have any other sources of liquidity. And when I was trained to do that at Chemical Bank, uh, you do that to come up with an internal risk rating, you know, one to nine, and, and uh, you know, that's the way they, they kind of categorize and establish it. At O'Brien Steely Partners, we do the exact same thing, but instead of coming up with a risk rating, we ask ourselves a core question. We say, you know, you've seen this type of scenario before. How does this movie end? This is the, the uniqueness of, of how do you underwrite all these different types of assets and credits. There, no matter what kind of business, what geography, what type of collateral, there are only five basic movie endings in credit. A loan might pay as agreed to maturity and pay off. You know, might. Uh, and when we buy unloved loans, they do. Uh, it might need to be modified, like the dairy farmers, uh, and then it can pay according to the modification. Or they may have borrowed in a different collateral universe. You know, before the, uh, the Great Recession of, of uh, 2008, people were borrowing in 2007 collateral values. You couldn't get refinanced of those collateral values in 2011. Or if you think about New York City taxi medallions, they cannot get refinanced at the same place they could, you know, five years ago. Um, but they can get refinanced at a discounted payoff number. So you, you know, set your expectations to a discounted payoff. Uh, or a deed in lieu of foreclosure. The business isn't working out, everybody agrees it isn't working out, and you resolve, sell the business, sell the collateral assets, and distribute what you can uh, to everybody who has a claim. Uh, and the last one is a fully contested foreclosure, either with or without bankruptcy, long timelines, everybody hires a lawyer, lots of expenses. And I'm here to tell you that even when I buy at a discount in my unloved, this is still loss mitigation. Nobody in my business is pursuing that as a distress for control way to make a profit, but you do have to do it sometimes. Uh, but you're usually dialing into a single digit type of return, not, not anything that was your deliberate business plan or, or hope or aspiration. The good news is, is that this portfolio, when we buy these unloved loans, you know, about 80% of the portfolio is in the two, first two movie endings, and only less than 5% is in that last category. And, and I think our success that way is due to our experience uh, and our perspective and our know-how and the fact that we're very, very disciplined internally, that we always ask ourselves, you know, when a loan stops paying, what is the root cause? And our experience is that they fall on a spectrum or a continuum of root causes. Um, from a credit crisis to a credit opportunist to a credit criminal. And so, you know, a credit crisis you know, you can actually define the event that happened that caused the cash flow to be disrupted. It's the hurricane. It's Uber. You know, it's something like that. And the borrower is forthright. He shows, puts all the information on the table. You deal with the facts as they are, and you work collaboratively on that together. A credit opportunist, on the other hand, uh, is somebody who is, you know, a wise guy. Uh, and, you know, there's no harm in trying to get a discount. You know, well, the worst thing is I have to pay it all. Uh, these people usually uh, uh, approach the situation arguing not about their situation, but about your documents or your staff. 
right? And, and, and so you're like, oh, you're arguing about the documents and the staff, not whether you can or can't pay back. Uh, there's a, a classic example of this came out of our FDIC uh, acquisition right here in Houston. $30 million credit, beautiful landmark building, and the borrower just doesn't think he needs to pay back the whole loan. Uh, and so we're working him through that process to disabuse him of that. <laughs> uh, and the last one is a credit criminal. And a credit criminal is someone who lies, obviously, uh, misdirects funds or assets, transfers businesses or, or collateral into someone else's name or, or you know, fabricates a non-arms link sale or something of that nature. And uh, when you're dealing with a credit criminal, uh, what you need to realize is, is that no amount of negotiating is going to convince that credit criminal to admit that he or she is a credit criminal, right? And so you're wasting your time. All you can really do is avail yourself of the courts. That's exactly what the courts are for, is to deal with criminals. Uh, and so, you know, we have a situation like that in Puerto Rico. Uh, we, we bought a loan secured by a beachfront motel, hotel. Uh, and after the hurricane, the, the borrower claimed damage and lack of operations, you know, interrupted business and stuff like that. Well, I went and visited myself. Sat in the bar, drank a beer. Pool's open. And the hotel is filled with FEMA workers on long-term contract, okay? And yet he's not paying, right? So, you know, are you going to argue with the guy who's saying, I'm not open? You're open. <laughs> so we go to court and, and, you know, that's all you can do. And when you're making this decision, I think I kind of made the point. You know, the big, big point, this is the big takeaway. Never treat a credit crisis like he's a criminal. But never treat a criminal like it's a crisis. And you have to satisfy yourself, your own organization, with that determination. And then, you know, if it's a credit crisis, be accommodating. Work through the situation. If it's, you know, credit opportunist, be resolute. There's not going to be a discount. If it's a credit criminal, let's just go to court. We don't need to waste breath talking about this stuff. And, and you know, that, I think that our organization benefits from clarity and conviction because we remember when we're actually considering compromising debt, that it's not our money, right? We are the hired experts for fire and police retirement system, for nurses and nuns, for teachers and, and, and staff, for scholarship recipients, right? And if it's a genuine crisis, those beneficiaries that expect us to work with the people, but if it's just a wise guy trying to steal money, they expect us to have the stamina and to stand up and to get their money back. And that's what we do. So, okay. Um, coasting towards the end. You know, uh, you know, the big takeaway, things aren't always what you think they might be at first blush. And I was walking around, took a walking tour of the Rice campus, and right over here by, by uh, uh, the Baker Institute is this Berlin Wall. And the fun thing about the Berlin Wall, two sides, right? There's the white, clean side that actually faced east towards suppression and totalitarianism. And then there's the ugly graffiti strewn side which faced west toward freedom of speech and, and freedom of press and freedom of assembly and freedom of religion. Well, it's not exactly what you would think it is. And, and that's very much what we see in credit investing. So, you know, I didn't come here to teach you how to spread numbers. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you have classes that, that do that. Uh, but rather to help you see the whole arc of the credit uh, and, and to see that there are plot twists all around. And, and so the question, what time is it? If time permits, I'll take some questions. Do you, is there a microphone or how are we doing it? How have you found the Puerto Rican courts in terms of you? Yeah. So the Puerto Rican courts, and, and you know, you ask about Puerto Rico, but you could ask about South Carolina, right? There's definitely a hometown advantage or disadvantage. Uh, we're able to avail ourselves of the federal courts in Puerto Rico under the legal principle called diversity, which is if I'm from Minnesota and you're from Texas and we have a dispute in excess of 250,000, we have a mutual right to go to federal court rather than local court. So that we generally we go to, go to the federal courts. Fun thing about doing that is once you establish that you're in the federal courts, the resolution is more predictable in terms of timing and result. So rational negotiations back up. 
If you're in somebody's hometown court, South Carolina, whatever, the, the, the borrower is not certain what the resolution would be. They have hope that they can get a you know, local elected judge helping them out. And I don't mean to pick on anybody. I'm trying not to pick on Puerto Rico, and I'm not trying to pick on South Carolina. You could say that you know, any state, anywhere, everybody has a hometown advantage. Yeah. What percentage of the loans, like the Wisconsin Bank or some of these municipalities, is it just a one on one negotiation they put it for the end or all? In my experience, um, ever since Enron, almost nothing is done strictly bilaterally. Almost everybody wants in bond trading, they call it a cover bid. Okay? Uh, and so, what you hope for in our, in our business. We're not hoping for unilateral, bilateral negotiations. We're hoping for a first mover advantage, like we enjoyed with first NBC. We had seen it for months before it went out to a public auction. And if it's if it's not a regulator, if it's a regulator, it's going to be twelve bidders or twenty bidders or something like that. Uh, but if it's then if it's a bank uh, transaction, they usually get they always get two, sometimes three bids. We hope to be the first bid with one other. And basically, if if you can be one of three bidders, that's a sustainable business model. If we win just by luck one of three times, and then you try to have more insight so you're better than luck, but a one in three hit rate, meaning due diligence done to resulting investment, uh, is, is a sustainable business model for us. Yes? <laughs> Sounds like an LP. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Business was good. Good. One. So, energy uh, is not an area of my personal expertise or our firm's expertise. We have played energy. Uh, I call it the ricochet trade, right? So, just just like when people were squeezed, uh, we didn't we didn't rush in and buy their their oil and gas positions, uh, but rather we looked at some budget motels. You know. So you know ancillary related distress, if you will, or credit crisis. Um, and, and, you know, so we can price adjust and there's an alternative use. We try to stay away from uh, businesses that are direct suppliers to the government, because then you're just getting government, you know, by, by proxy, government credit risk. So, you know, all of our stuff down in Puerto Rico, it's not like we're investing in the trash collection in Puerto Rico, which is waiting on the city to pay them, right? So that so we don't do that. And we don't try, we try not to directly bear commodity risk, oil and gas risk, energy price risk. But if you go one step beyond that to, uh, you know, um, hotels, a good example, that would be something we would, we would do. We, we don't lose money very often, but we, we, we this is before founding O'Brien Staley Partners is my prior firm. Uh, we, everything we do, nothing settles on standard terms and conditions. Everything is a negotiated purchase and sale agreement. And so you have to, when you agree on price, you also have to agree on settlement terms and reps and warranties and what did the seller do before he gave you the portfolio? What was his filtering or screening or calling process? And uh, uh, this is a long time ago. Uh, we participated in an FDIC sale and the FDIC said, we have called all of the credit files, all the loan files, uh, and you acknowledge as buyer that some documents have been removed from the file. I'm like, yeah. So, you know, we called up and we said, well, what does that mean? They said, ah, oh, there are some things that, you know, were legal related and we took them out. I'm like, well, I mean, can't you just, like, give me the list of what legal documents you took out? No, we can't do that. And we kind of hemmed and hawed about it, and uh, we decided to, to go forward anyway, I thought, ah, you know, probably, probably it's nothing. And we won the deal, and at closing, they showed up with seven extra banker's boxes of correspondence they had pulled out of every file, okay? Every piece of correspondence was adverse to the credit that came out of it. And, and uh, some well-meaning government employee thought that that was how to maximize recovery for the taxpayers, right? I thought it was fraudulent. And so we, we, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so then you, so then you face the question, do you sue the government? Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, so we worked out the portfolio. It was, you know, it was about a $10 million investment. We wound up at the end of the day, losing $200,000. Okay. We lost all of the expected profit 
and two hundred thousand dollars from the basis, right? And we didn't sue the government because you don't get to sue the government, and you don't win that. They got lots of lawyers, right? And you know, my my uh, my mom used to say, "Never wrestle with a pig. You both get dirty, and one of you likes it." You know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think I'll take one more question if there is one. If, if not, if not, I see, I see my roommate and uh, my, my college roommate and his wife, Anna. We both, we all went to the University of Chicago together. And uh, Mike, Anna, do you know what time it is? Happy hour. Good. So we'll all go to the happy hour. Pizza and beer is on, on Kate. And uh, if you have more questions, happy to pick it up over there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate it.